Hello, friends. I just finished listening to the bells here at St. Paul's, and I thought I would come in and share a few thoughts about all that has transpired over the past week. First, I want to start by letting you know the recording this morning that you may have watched for our Pentecost service was actually recorded a week and a half ago. You may know that our Director of Communications, Kim Fry, left this week. She's headed out to California, to uh, she and her husband, to be closer to their daughter and her family. And so we recorded ahead of time so that uh, she would be able to get through all of her responsibilities before she moved. Our new Director of Communications starts next week. So just so you know, this was recorded uh, a week and a half ago, and I know so much has transpired in our country since then. This morning at our Zoom coffee hour, we able, were able to um, share our thoughts and feelings and about all that's been going on and talk about what we might do next. But I, I wanted to share some of my thoughts with you. You may have seen that pastoral letters came out from both Bishop Hollingsworth and presiding Bishop Michael Curry. And I want to read to you a portion of what uh, Michael Curry shared with us. All right, so here are his words. Our long-term commitment to racial justice and reconciliation is embedded in our identity as baptized followers of Jesus. We will still be doing it when the news cameras are long gone. In the midst of COVID-19 and the pressure cooker of a society in turmoil, a Minnesota man named George Floyd was brutally killed. His basic human dignity was stripped by someone charged to protect our common humanity. Perhaps the deeper pain is the fact that this was not an isolated incident. It happened to Breonna Taylor on March 13th in Kentucky. It happened to Ahmed Arbery on February 23rd in Georgia. Racial, racial terror in this form occurred when I was a teenager, Bishop Curry is sharing with us, when he was a teenager growing up black in Buffalo, New York. It extends back to the lynching of Emmett Till in 1955 and well before that. It's not just our present or our history. It's part of the fabric of American life. But we need not be paralyzed by our past or our present. We are not slaves to fate, but people of faith. Our long-term commitment to racial justice and reconciliation is embedded in our identity as baptized followers of Jesus. We will still be doing it when the news cameras are long gone. That work of racial, racial reconciliation and justice, what we know as becoming beloved community, is happening across our Episcopal Church. It's happening in Minnesota and in the Diocese of Kentucky, Georgia and Atlanta, across America and around the world. That mission matters now more than ever, and it is work that belongs to all of us. It must go on when racist violence and pr police brutality are no longer front page news. It must go on when the work is not fashionable and when the way seems hard and we feel utterly alone. It is the difficult labor of picking up the cross of Jesus like Simon of Cyrene and carrying it until no one, no matter their color, no matter their class, no matter their caste, until no child of God is degraded and disrespected by anybody. That is God's dream. This is our work. And we shall not cease until God's dream is realized. Is this hopelessly naive? No. The vision of God's dream is no idealistic utopia. It is our only real hope. And St. Paul says, hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Real love is the dogged commitment to live my faith in the most unselfish, even sacrificial ways, to love God, love my neighbor, love the earth, and truly love myself. Perhaps most difficult in times like this, it is even love for my enemy. 
That is why we cannot condone violence. Violence against any person conducted by some police officers or by some protesters is violence against a child of God created in God's image. No, as followers of Christ, we do not condone violence. Neither do we condone our nation's collective complicit silence in the face of injustice and violent death. The anger of so many on our streets is born out of the accumulated frustration that so few seem to care when another black, brown, or native life is snuffed out. But there is another way. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, a broken man lay on the side of the road. The religious leaders who passed were largely indifferent. Only the Samaritan saw the wounded stranger and acted. He provided medical care and housing. He made provision for this stranger's well-being. He helped and healed a fellow child of God. Love, as Jesus teaches, is action like this as well as attitude. It seeks the good, the well-being, and the welfare of others as well as oneself. That way of real love is the only way there is. The presiding bishop goes on in his letter to talk about resources that we all can take a look at to help us as we move forward. But I want to offer a few of my thoughts also. I've been thinking much about this, and it feels like this is precisely the time when we have to move from our head to our hearts. I think we have to feel this pain, and I know that's hard, but I think it is the way forward. I think about all of these parents of black children that every single time their child walks out the door, whether they're going to school or to play sports or to play with a friend or to run an errand, every single time they walk out the door, parents worry about what's going to happen to their child, about how they might end up in an encounter with a policeman and who knows what might happen through no fault of their own every single time they walk out the door. I think we need to feel that pain. I was in a wonderful webinar this week with Kelly Brown Douglas. She is the canon theologian to the National Church. She also is the dean of the Divinity School, the Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary. And she talked on this call about kairos, the Greek word meaning opportunity, that we can't let this time pass that here, this is our opportunity. We are accountable to a more just future. This is happening on our watch, and it's time for us to do something. It's time for us to know God's love and to, and to create the kingdom that God calls us to create. I truly believe that we are not created, we're not in this world simply for ourselves to live the life that we are living. We are here for one another. That's our whole purpose, is justice and righteousness, to care for one another. As Kelly said, this is happening on our watch. This is our time to make a difference, to remember, to carry with us time, and time again, how this happens over and over and over again. Tamir Rice, right here in Cleveland, it's our time to feel that pain so that we are motivated to make change. That is our faith, that we feel the pain, that we are empathetic, not that we get stuck in that place, but that we use that as inspiration to make change. So let's do that. Let's all think about how we as individuals, what our gifts are that we can offer. We can all pray. We can donate to organizations that carry on this work. We can engage in conversation and action here at St. Paul's. But let's all think about and carry in our hearts, make it part of our prayer, what we can do next. God's love is justice.